Welcome to the Dr. Geo podcast. I am your host, Dr. Geo, where it is my intention to help you with your prostate health and how to live better with age. Well, you know all about Dr. Stevenson, so we're going to get right to it. <laughs> Andrew, thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Thanks, Geo. It's a late day for you as, as well. So um, do you have children? I have four. <laughs> So it's ne never a dull moment. <laughs> Do you have children? Did he answer that one? You know, I'll think of you. We have three. And whenever it seems like it's a little too much, I'll just think of you. And, and I won't complain. Uh, what are the age age ranges? Uh, so I have a tw 20 years, uh, two 18-year-olds, and a, and a 16-year-old. All right. So almost completely empty nester, uh, probably. Getting close. Right? Yep. Getting close. Well, yep. congrats on that. Thank you. Um, Wow, you had them. They were kind of close in age, so there was a time where it got a little crazy there, didn't it? <laughs> well, we we were in New York City. I was at Sloan Kettering in a like an eight hundred square foot apartment uh, uh, with strollers uh, all over the place. So it was a fun time. <laughs> I, I know, I know that feeling, uh, unfortunately, too well. Um, speaking of Sloan Kettering, so tell us a little bit about about you. About you know. I always ask the question, okay, you, you do, you know, you go to medical school and at some point you say, all right, I want to do urology. But in some areas uh, in the world, um, I've noticed that in most places around the world, you don't have really, most, your, all urologists are surgeons, but they don't have the luxury of subspecializing. So the guy in Columbia, for example, that does his prostatectomies, he also does his incontinence from the prostatectomy. So he wants to make sure mm -hmm. that he does a good surgery, right? Um, but over here, or at least in big cities, there's subspecialties, and and you apparently did um, some work at Sloan. So, what's wh why did you get into uh, oncology? What what was that about? You could have gotten into kidney stones, and sure. you could have chosen the road less travel. We were talking about uh, prior to recording uh, that you do cystectomies, and again, I'm a non-surgeon, but I I you know I work near next to the best. Gary Steinberg, one of our guys, is now back to one of your guys because he's going to read. Um, those are, I mean, those are tough surgeries, right? Those are tough. Sometimes you get calls in the middle of the night. So what, what got you into say, you know what, Euro Ankh, that's exactly what I want to do. What got you into making that decision? Yeah. It, you know, when I, so I, I was I'm originally from Canada. I did my mm -hmm. uh, surgical training in, in Montreal mm -hmm. uh, at a place called McGill. And yeah. in the 1990s, uh, the pro, I mean, prostate cancer as a result of, the discovery of PSA uh, was undergoing an enormous transformation in the sense mm -hmm. that we were now diagnosing a lot more cancers, uh, a lot of cancers that were aggressive. We were detecting early and, you know, when there's been a reduction in deaths from prostate cancer, I think because of PSA screening. For sure. So that's been an enormous contribution. The downside is that we're detecting a lot of cancers that, that are, uh, have, questionable clinical significance. And let me explain yeah. what that means. It means yeah. that these cancers, it's uncertain whether their detection or treatment will benefit the patient in any way. And the yeah. problem with that in prostate cancer is all the treatments, no matter how good the, the, the oncologist is, be it a surgeon or radiation oncologist, all these treatments, you know, have important side effects and impacts on quality of life. So in the 1990s, when I was doing my urology training, you know, the, the field was just exploding with new information, um, so many questions about uh, how we should treat prostate cancer, how we should diagnose prostate cancer. My very first paper I ever published was mm. uh, looking at men on, on active surveillance or watchful waiting and the utility of PSA. I mean, that's how, that's how little we understood at the dawn of With clots? Uh, Claude, no, Lori Klotz, a pioneer in, in yeah. active surveillance. He's at the University of Toronto. Yeah. Uh, I was in Montreal. So, you know, uh, sure. you know, Canada is uh, uh, in part because of the constraints of the healthcare care system. Uh, um, you know, it, there's it, it's certainly they've made a lot of important discoveries in expectant management of, of a lot of different cancers. Sure. Uh, prostate in particular. And, and Lori Klotz is certainly one of the, the leaders and remains a leader, you know, 25 years later. So that's what got me interested in prostate cancer, got me interested in urologic oncology. And I pursued a fellowship at Sloan Kettering. And essentially, that's not not a bad place to pursue. A, not a too bad. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> uh, uh, it's the big house uh, when it comes to cancer and cancer research. So 
learn enormous amount there from my mentor, Doctor Scardino. Uh, uh, he was he was uh, he just recently retired. As Correct. You know. Yeah, legend, but he was uh, I'm sure a wonderful field. mentor. Uh, absolutely, they so many great mentors from my experience there, and uh, so then I, I from there I was at Cleveland Clinic for many years, and I've been now here in Chicago at Rush for the last four years. So. Oh, okay. Uh, it, it's, it's been, uh, you know, it's been a nice journey and, and it's nice to, you know, move the, move the chains, if you will, and, and uh, keep making progress in this disease. And, you know, over the last, you know, as I mentioned in the 1990s, how the, the field had changed in transformative ways from PSA and early detection yeah. and, and treatment. And, you know, I think we probably overshot a bit too much uh, in that the sense that we were over treating an enormous number of patients. Um, you know, expectant management or active surveillance yeah. was seldom utilized. And now, you know, over the last 20 years, you know, the pendulum has really started to swing in the other direction where I think now active surveillance for, you know, older men, particularly those who have, uh, you know, without aggressive features of their prostate cancer are, are now being considered for, for observation. So, you know, the field has obviously changed a lot in, in over the course of my career and it, and it's nice to be a part of making some of those contributions. That's wonderful. Um, <clears throat> so Chicago, a little bit better than Cleveland, Andrew? Just a little bit? <laughs> uh, I'm not, 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 uh, uh, not going to disparage uh, Cleveland. <laughs> uh, uh, don't, you know. don't worry. Do, Dr. Uh, Dr. Klein, I'm, I'm trying to have him as well, Eric Klein, um, who is uh, one of the uh, – geniuses of of our field uh and and prostate cancer um um i, I won't i won't tell him that i, I won't tell <laughs> though, though he comes to new york pretty often i think there's a reason for that yeah yeah well you know <clears throat> chicago's uh it's a little closer to new york uh than cleveland <laughs> i'll put it that way how's that that's right that's right <clears throat> excuse me so prostate cancer so we've come a long way look the other um the pendulum swung completely the wrong, completely too far the other way, right? After the United States Preventative Task Force in 2012, where then we saw higher rates of aggressive. So we were kind of back to the 1980s where people were coming with aggressive prostate cancer because they their GPs were saying, no, we're not, we're not, I'm not doing a PSA on you. So I always was saying, look, and as a natural holistic doctor, I'm, I really look at um, c conventional um, diagnostics and therapeutics differently, uh, as objective as possible, though I am biased towards everybody has their bias, right? I'm biased towards less is more natural lifestyle medicine. But even back then, I was like, well, no, we can't. We can't. I mean, there, it's not that the PSA is a problem, it's how you utilize it. A PSA of a 5.2 on a 70 year old man, that doesn't necessarily, you know, maybe they don't need a biopsy uh, and, and so forth. So I, I think that. Um, what was it? Uh, a few years after 2012, they just say, "Okay, that's a decision between uh, you and your doctor how you use uh, utilize the PSA for screening." Well, so I, in your, if I could just add, yeah. you know, uh, a, a nice editorial um, mm. written many years ago by one of my colleagues at Cleveland Clinic, Steve Jones. He said, uh, "You know, the title of the editorial was Prostate Cancer: Are We Overdiagnosing or Are We Underthinking?" And uh, to, right. to your point, I think that uh, certainly, uh, you know, even as a as a resident back in the late 1990s, I would, it was evident that we we're over treating an enormous number of patients. And, it, you know, it just I think that there was a pressures on the part of the patient, perhaps on the part of the surgeon sure. you know, to treat these patients where it was you know, evident that we were clearly over treating a large number of these patients. So it's nice to see the field really catch up with the data. A hundred percent. And, and, and like I tell my patients, I said, look, the, the technology and the information has never been better in terms of if you need a biopsy, you need a biopsy. And if you need a biopsy, there's a, a, a method of doing a really good biopsy is no longer, or it's, it, many places still around the country, around the world, it's still ultrasound guided and blind biopsy because they just don't have the technology. But in mo in some places they have uh, MRI guided. So let, let's go through a scenario here. So patient comes in with a, what's the process in your practice, Andrew, where they come in and they say, okay, look, I, I have this uh, PSA test, uh, this PSA value. Um, do you, so I guess it depends case by case. So a 58 year old man, let's just say comes into your office, their PSA is something like 4.5 
no no family history. What's your process? Is it you know the schedule you the schedule you for a biopsy, or do you do something else before they undergo a biopsy? I mean, I think there are uh, some important steps one should take rather than rush to biopsy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have to. You know, he may be a fifty eight year old, but not all fifty eight year olds are created equally. You know, it's okay. really important in all patients to assess comorbidities. Uh, that means other illnesses, uh, try to estimate their life expectancy. And we do that through ascertaining their prior medical history, smoking history. I always take a pretty thorough history, family history of lung, not just a prostate mm -hmm. cancer, but family history of longevity. You know, patients whose parents, you know, lived into their late 90s, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I, I would, you know, obviously uh, think of that patient a little bit differently than the average patient. So that's one thing that we always do. Uh, and the other thing is we know that PSA, though uh, a fairly good marker uh, at a dying, identifying patients at risk for having prostate cancer and for having important prostate cancer, there's a lot of variability in the PSA in the individual man from test to test. So if you were to do the same PSA test in every man like once a month for a year, you would see this highly varied pattern. <laughs> Um, that relates or at to least it. you would hope to see that because when it's well, linear going just up, 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 well, that's not a great sure, sign, right? Sure enough. And so the first thing I do before doing anything is I always get a confirmatory PSA. And there's, a, there's a lot of good evidence to suggest that men who have a spike in the PSA, it's just a spurious elevation. Uh, and it's, so it's important to, to, to confirm that that patient has a really elevated PSA on, on more than one test before uh, making decisions about biopsy. Uh, and how far after that visit do you go for the, you, you test for the confirmatory uh, PSA? Yeah, I mean, a, it's a month later yeah, or? Yeah, typically about six weeks, you know. About six weeks, yeah. okay. Um, people have suggested using antibiotics, which I think now we discourage um, yeah. in the absence of symptoms. There's really no role for antibiotics. It just encourages uh, resistance. And the reason why some people would do that is for fear of prostatitis, right? Well, I mean, that's that's the, the, the thinking behind it. There's not a whole lot of evidence to support that's that. Right. But the, the idea is that maybe there's some subclinical inflammation or infection that's causing this PSA spike. And so, you know, a lot of people, a lot of prominent people in the field used to recommend antibiotics. I think that practice is really discouraged now. Uh, some people have also suggested giving patients a trial of some anti-inflammatory like ibuprofen, again, uh, not a Even lot. if they're asymptomatic. Uh, correct. Again, the, yeah. <laughs> there's not there's not good data for that. Uh, you know, if you just simply repeat the PSA, I think it's probably more important than any of these other uh, steps. So once you have a, a, a persistently elevated PSA, and obviously particularly in a patient who's otherwise in good health and who has a life expectancy of 10 years or more, then I walk them through. There's various risk calculators that one can use. I happen to use something called the PCPT calculator. Uh, I think it's probably the most um, reliable, the most robust. Without getting into the details, it considers a lot of factors in the patient, not just their PSA level. It considers age, ethnicity, prior biopsy history, prostate exam findings, family history, and you can use that to to uh, you know, estimate the the patient's risk of having prostate cancer. More mm -hmm. importantly, though, the risk of having clinically important cancer, which is what we really worry about the most. Less, I'm less interested about any prostate cancer because there's obviously a lot of prostate cancers that we shouldn't be diagnosing. Um, and it just leads to a lot of cost and anxiety to the patient. So I base it on the risk of important prostate cancer. And to put it in context, um, you know, and it gives you a, a percentage, you know, so say 30% risk of having prostate cancer, 14% risk of having important prostate cancer. Patients often have difficult difficulty putting those numbers into context. And I tell them, you know, that your lifetime risk of having prostate cancer is about 18%. Your lifetime risk of having clinically important cancer perhaps is 3 to 4%. So I use that baseline risk to kind of frame for the patient their risk relative to the average man their age. So in the example I gave you, a 30% risk of prostate cancer, you know, that's not so higher than the average male, but it's 12% risk of high-grade cancer that's like three or four fold higher than the average male. So that man, I think, should be considered certainly for a biopsy. Now, what do you do after that? 
So I think in that case, once you've had a confirmatory... If I may interrupt sure. for, uh, for a second, Andrew, the PCP, PCPT calc- calculator. is a calc- yeah. calculator, so that's downloadable, you just, Google. You, you just Google. I just Google it in clinic, just type PCPT calculator, and, and even the individual a patient could go online and, and enter sure. in their values and assess their risk. So, um, And it tells you <clears throat> the possibility, so the percentage that it gives you, it tells you the possibility of having, let's just say, a Gleason 7 or higher. And, Correct. And not a, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's good. And so that, you know, I use that. It, what you find, so in the example that you gave, the 50, 58-year-old man, his PSA is 4.5. Uh, you know, you, there used to be this, this rule that the PSA is more than 4. You know, it's abnormal sure. and you should do a biopsy. And you'll find Ridiculous. that there's a lot yeah. of patients just like that, whose PSA levels are more than four, that when you run them through that calculator, sure. their risk of cancer or high-grade cancer is not terribly elevated relative to the baseline risk. So I wouldn't necessarily move forward for a biopsy sure. in that scenario. So I think Andrew, it's helpful. Uh, let me ask you a question here that uh, sure. I want to know because you – Actually, you're older than I thought based on the history of when you went to fellowship. Yeah. So you have a lot of experience. <laughs> How many – I've always um, – when I give uh, talks and um, and courses, I always talk about the possibility, and I've seen it, um, of men with very low PSA with prostate cancer, even intermediate or high risk. From the top of your head, you don't have to be exact. How many of these have you seen percentage-wise that they may have a PSA of one point? to 1.5 and they may have you know higher than a gleason six yeah i mean it's rare because we typically don't biopsy those men Um, that's right you know the threshold for biopsy you know for me is seldom you know less than two or three yeah Uh, except but let's say they have a positive dre or something well for sure in that scenario Uh, but for sure i've seen this in very young men men in their Mm -hmm. 30s early 40s we know that Mm. their psa level should be Certainly less than two, certainly less than one in the vast majority. So, you know, I have had these patients who, for whatever reason, get an executive physical and then mm. someone just draws a PSA without really thinking about it. And then he comes in with a PSA of 1.9 or, you know, and that that that's a very different scenario. It's very rare for a very young man to have a PSA of, say, 1.9. And certainly I've found high grade cancers in a, in a non-significant number of those cases. So. It, it all depends on the context. But yeah, well, one point nine is not a low number in a thirty-eight year old man no. for sure. Yeah, it should be really uh, <laughs> less than point five, or certainly less than one. Sure. Yeah. Great. So then, so then you got this forty-five year old, a uh, fi- uh, fifty-four, fifty-eight, fifty-eight year old guy, four point five, and um, you do a follow-up PSA, a confirmatory PSA, and let's just say that stays around the four point seven next time, and his uh. PCPT calculator says, you know, somewhere about 20%. What's next? Would you do a, when do you decide, let me ask you a direct question. When would you decide to do another test, like um, a, 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 a urine test, like select MDX or exo DX? Or would you say, look, right into, uh, you're going right for an MRI and then based on the MRI, we'll do a biopsy. When, when will you select some of these um, more sensitive and specific tests that are urine based sure there's a whole bunch of tests in the marketplace you mentioned select md uh there's the prostate health index there's a 4k score even just a free psa a free to total psa is an adjunctive test that you can use how Uh, valuable is the percentage free psa still is it still one of the so if it's above you know 20 percent, 25 percent, do you are you good I, I I don't know how to utilize. I mean, I've been doing this for a long time, and sometimes I don't feel comfortable with just that alone. I, sure. That's one factor out of maybe seven factors in my practice. How do you feel about the free? Uh, well, PSA? you know, when you actually in the PCPT calculator I mentioned, you can actually enter in the free to total ratio, mm. and you'll see mm. that that really does change uh, mm. or move the chains in one direction or the other. So I typically use it in the context of that. Some of the other tests that I mentioned, so in so the, the, the reason to do these additional tests, I think, mm. is in part to avoid uh, doing an unnecessary biopsy. So in a young man, you know, who has a long life expectancy, who has an important risk of prostate cancer, 
<clears throat> I'm usually pretty aggressive about you know diagnosing biopsying those men because those are the men who will benefit the most and who have the the most to lose if you somehow miss an important cancer. So in the younger man, uh, you know if if it's confirmatory PSA is high, uh, and particularly in their you know early to mid fifties, I'll I'll typically go straight for an MRI, and in addition I'll do the biopsy you know regardless of the MRI finding. So even men with a negative MRI. I'll still recommend a biopsy if his baseline risk is high. So some of these other tests that I would do is typically in older men, where as you age, the prostate grows. And when it grows, the PSA goes up. And so there's very good evidence that as you age, your PSA gets higher and higher, just simply because older men tend to have bigger prostates and more prostates means more PSA. So those men can be pose a real diagnostic challenge. Um, they're also men who may not benefit from early diagnosis and treatment because they're getting older. So mm -hmm. I typically use some of these adjunctive tests to help me discriminate who has a risk of important cancer, uh, who are the men who are more likely to have a PSA elevation just because of benign enlargement. And so largely I use it in that population to decide, you know, who are men probably who we maybe don't have to be so aggressive about uh, subjecting them to a biopsy. And on the other hand, the older men who may be at risk for having important cancer that we don't want to miss. So that's kind of the sweet spot that in my practice for some of these adjunctive tests that we that we mentioned. You know, a lot of the guidelines are sort of suggesting, um, you know, just don't even screen men over 70, right? That, that they're going to probably, if they have, they'll die with it, not from it. Not in my practice. Like the, <laughs> I don't know if it's an, it, it, the homogeneity of my practice or maybe, you know, I have patients from all over, including New York, but these guys are very healthy. Like there are, there are no meds. Uh, they take no meds uh, oftentimes, or they take maybe a blood pressure medication. So there again, these guidelines are, you know, exactly that guidelines. Um, well, I, I, to, to speak to that, you know, chronological age uh, is, it doesn't mean a whole lot. And that's to get back to my earlier statement, you really want to assess the whole patient and try to yeah. you know, you estimate their life expectancy. So, you know, there could be a 70 year old guy who's running marathons, who doesn't take a pill. He's never had any surgery. Right. He you know, he's, he's, he's healthy, probably healthier than me. I mean, that's guy <laughs> has a life expectancy, certainly more than 10 years. I, I certainly would not uh, recommend discontinuing screening in him just because he turns 70 on the same side. You know, there's some guys in their fifties who have a, a ton of comorbidities, you know, heart disease, diabetes, you know, smoking history, emphysema. Again, those guys perhaps should be uh, undergo routine screening. So just because their life expectancy is probably not going to be long enough for them to benefit. So I think you just have to individualize yeah. everything. Chronological age and biological age, or they can be two different things. Indeed. You know, it reminds me when I worked, when I worked, um, I was interning back in the day with a, with a urologist at Columbia and um, Columbia University, not Columbia, the country. Um, and, um, you know, the joke was always with the older guy who's insisting on a biopsy is look next visit. If you bring your mo your mother with you to the next visit, we'll do a biopsy. <laughs> right. So you have the 75 year old, you bring it. Well, no, my, my parents are deceased. Okay. Well then you, we're not doing it. Right. We had an 82 year old guy and we said, look, well, next time when you bring your mother, he brought his 103 year old mother to the next visit. How can you say no to her, right? <laughs> you can't. You can't say no to mom at 103 years old. So indeed, he got a biopsy and he got his prostate removed. The oldest person I've ever seen get their prostate removed, and actually, he's still going hard, and he does have those uh, longevity uh, genes. So uh, <laughs> never uh, forget him. Um, great guy. He's in his 90s, still doing well now. Um, all right. So you get a, you get a, so you do, so in your, so you, you said something very interesting, low, um, in a young man, even with a negative MRI with a PSA, that's either 58 year old guy, like our guy at 4.5, or let's just say the you know, 38 year old guy with a 1.9, you would still do a biopsy. I don't know that everyone would agree with that. Is that kind of your own thing based on? the PSA number and, and their age relative to their age? Well, you have to understand MRI uh, is different in different shops uh, and different mm -hmm. with different readers. So, you know, there may be, um, 
you know, highly, highly specialized centers where, uh, you know, the reliability of MRI is sound. But I think the data really suggests that if the desire, if the goal is to, to not miss aggressive prostate cancer, I think this is reflected in the guidelines, the European guidelines, I believe in the AUA guidelines as well, is that, you know, an MRI is recommended, MR guide or biopsy is recommended in addition to a systemic biopsy. So um, the point being is that even in the face of a negative MRI, I still think in a, in a patient who has an elevated baseline risk, I would still recommend that we do a systematic biopsy. And in part because, you know, the negative predictive value, which is, sorry, to get into the into the weeds with into the, the weeds, terminology, yeah. but just it's means okay. the reliability of a negative MRI to rule out important prostate cancer is not 100%. Uh, right. And so in a young man with who I've tested, Is it about 70%, I want to say? Well, it ranges from about, I think probably most people would quote something around 80%. So mm-hmm. it's still a one in five chance you may find something important. Um, you know, you know, MRI, there's been a, there's a lot of, I, I debated this recently in a meeting about MRI. I mean, I think I, I have uh, um, a fairly balanced view of MRI. Um you know, we, I was certainly an early adopter. Let's hear it. about it. I'm, I'm actually very interested. Well, you know, I, you know, there's been a lot of randomized trials to date. And, yeah. uh, and when you look at the, the hierarchy of endpoints uh, for, for MRI, uh, the first being is it does it, you know, increase the detection of really important cancers uh, and, and potentially impact on mortality? Answer is no. Uh, does it reduce um, uh, uh, treatment of cancer. So in all the randomized trials, the treatment rate is virtually the same in MRI versus systematic. So it's not reducing over treatment. It is reducing biopsies in some studies. Uh, and so certainly that's an advantage. But, you know, the, the key things with, with any, any biomarker, if you mm-hmm. will, uh, is we want to reduce mortality. We want to reduce not just overdiagnosis. We want to reduce treatment. And in terms of the and, and the, the the available evidence to suggest it doesn't impact that. Uh, in terms of overdiagnosis, there's conflicting results. Some studies show that MRI detects the same number of cancers as systematic biopsy. Some suggest perhaps it's slightly reduced, but that the impact is 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 fairly modest. So, the thing about MRI is we get mm. we get caught in the weeds of well, it redu- yeah. reduces insignificant prostate cancer. It maybe uh, doesn't compromise significant prostate cancer, but you know, we don't really know what these terms really mean now in mm-hmm. the MR guided biopsy. And, and a lot of, for example, a lot of intermediate grade cancers we thought were clinically important, we now understand in many cases may not pose a significant p- harm to patients. So, you know, a lot of these endpoints that they're looking at in the trials are a little soft. But those hard ones I told you about, does it, re- does it in- improve detection of really bad cancers? No. Does it reduce treatment of cancers? No. Does it reduce diagnosis of cancers? The data is mixed. It definitely does. Is it a function of the MRI? Is it a function of the treatment? Is it a function of the person reading the MRI? Do we know? Well, these are the randomized trials, you know, all done yeah. at, at centers of excellence. So, you know, presumably yeah. they were evaluated by prostate cancer specialists, both in the United States and abroad. So, um, so that's, you know, that's, that's part of the reason why, uh, um, you know, I, 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 I certainly think MRI is valuable. I think MRI makes your biopsy better. I don't think MRI is a biomarker to identify who shouldn't have a biopsy. I just don't think it's there yet. And a patient who has an otherwise elevated risk, who is on the younger side, I would still recommend a biopsy. And I think if you pulled most urologists around the country, I think most Mm. would feel the same. Sure. Okay, very good. So, so then we, so you, you, you mentioned systemic biopsies a few times. Sure. Just for the listener, what, what, what defines systemic biopsy? So systemic biopsy is really what we were doing before MRI. So MRI is probably the most reliable way to identify if there's cancer in the prostate and where it is. And so then you can use the MRI to make sure that you target that abnormal area. You know, prostates vary in the size from the size of a plum to the size of a, an orange, for, for example. Yep. And we're only sampling such a very small percentage of the gland. So there's the fear that we're gonna miss important cancers if we just do blind biopsies, but that's essentially what we're doing. We're using ultrasound, not to identify the areas of abnormalities, but just simply to make sure that we're sampling all the various 
parts of the prostate so that we're, we're we 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 do a thorough evaluation and we get biopsies from all areas to determine if there's cancer or not. So that's what we mean by a systemic biopsy. It just means an ultrasound guided biopsy, where the ultra right. where the ultrasound is not helpful for anything other than to make make sure that it it tells us the geography or the or the the roadmap. So we make sure that we sample all the different areas. Right. <clears throat> and you typically still is about 12 cores, 12 to 16, typically, typically give or take. Correct. Yeah. And the one thing that's changed. Unless a saturation biopsy, do you do m many of those? And if so, why? So a saturation biopsy is how many cores could be? It's typically 20 or more. I think it's really yeah. fallen out of favor uh, in the mm. era of MRI. We just mm. used to like, well, let's just increase the number of cores. And so we don't miss anything. So that's kind of, I think, fallen out of favor in, in many uh, uh practices or many physicians minds what's gained interest of late is in, is starting to do transperineal biopsies right. so mm -hmm. instead of going conventionally through the rectum to sample the prostate we actually go through a kind of the skin at, in, in, in between the the anus and the scrotum and i think that's that there are certainly some advantages to the theoretical advantages to that in terms of sampling the areas of concern you can sample the posterior parts near the rectum. You can also sample the anterior parts very easily. Uh, I've I've started to to do this in increasing the increasing number mm -hmm. of men. So uh, you know the data would suggest that we're not compromising uh, our cancer diagnosis. We're certainly reducing the the complications of biopsy infection being the the most important one. Al almost a zero, pretty much. Pretty much, yeah. It's a trivial number. Um, uh, you know, far less than one percent. Um, then, and, you know, there may be some theoretical advantages in terms of enhancing diagnosis. So, um, yeah. So now, you know, and I think there's a shift in the field. There's some randomized trials looking at transrectal versus transperineal biopsies. So we await those results. Right. I'm, I'm aware and I'm, I look forward to those as well. We do, we are too many people, our, uh, my, our colleagues at NYU do, um, are, are doing a lot of transperineal, as you may know, and, collecting the data there and mm -hmm. probably will be pu publishing their results soon as well. So you mentioned a couple of things that was interesting. So one of the things that we always concern with is undersampling. So you mentioned, Hey, the prostate could be the size of a plum or an orange and is a very thin needle, it's like an acupuncture needle coming in a little bit bigger, maybe gauge wise, but not, not, so you can, I always say if you get 100 cores of a biopsy, you may have 1% of the whole prostate. If you get 100 cores. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the 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 fear is always undersampling. It, what else? What are we missing? And then, of course, at least my patients and, and many of yours is like, OK, I don't want to do a biopsy every six months, every 12 months for X amount of time. That's just a lot of biopsy. So. The utilization of these tumor biomarkers for stratification, right? How do you use them? I, I, I tend to use them quite a bit. And I've noticed that a, a few of our colleagues around the country are sort of against them. <laughs> so what's your approach? I always think that, hey, I want to I wanna know, I want a snapshot of the whole prostate, not just those scores, so that our patient can make an informed decision. And I think that those... Um, tissue-based uh, biomarkers are helpful. So we're talking about um, uh, 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 the GPS test. I think there is no longer the Oncotype test, the GPS test with uh, um, MDX Health uh, or um, Decipher or Polaris. Those are the big three. I don't know if there are any, any others. So what's your approach? Which ones do you use and how do you use it? Yeah, so the patient who has a negative biopsy, for example, uh, whose PSA remains elevated, um, you know, unfortunately, we can't tell them you don't have prostate cancer. This is nothing to worry about. Uh, right. You know, good luck to you. Um, no, uh, we know that uh, you mentioned undersampling, missing important cancers. We know that about 20 to 30 percent of men, despite a negative biopsy, will have cancer, you know, within one to two years. So I, we typically recommend keep continuing to follow those men with PSAs. Uh, if a patient like that has not had an MRI. I think it's reasonable to do an MRI uh, to make sure you're not missing something important. And then there are also biomarkers that you can use. One is called Confirm MDX. And what it does is it actually looks at the tissue, the negative biopsy tissue that was sampled, and they're looking for 
genome or epigenetic changes, what they call methylation, in the normal prostate tissue. And that can give you a fairly, uh, uh, well, a, a reliable risk of it having important cancers, which can actually map to the area of the prostate where these changes have occurred. So those are the patients, if it's elevated, you may want to consider them for a, a repeat biopsy. Uh, some of the markers that you mentioned, like on the GPS test, Decipher, Polaris, these are markers that we use in men who have prostate cancer, typically low and intermediate risk prostate cancer, mm. uh, because the, 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 the grading, so uh, the grade group one through five, so grade group one and two cancers, in many cases, don't necessarily require immediate aggressive treatment. I mentioned at the outset, the treatment does have some important side effects and impacts on quality of life. And so increasingly, we're embracing an observational strategy or active surveillance in these men. The concern, of course, is based on the biops, are we underestimating the amount of cancer? Are we under underestimating the grade? And does grade alone give us an accurate assessment of aggressiveness? The easy answer to all that is no, no, and no. Um, so we need better tools to accurately predict the aggressiveness in the cancer and the biologic potential of those of those cancers. So in men who are open to active surveillance who don't have high risk prostate cancer, um, it's uh, uh, typically we've recommended doing a, a repeat biopsy uh, mm. within six or 12 months just to verify that we're not missing something more important. People have looked at adding MRI in this context. But I think that this is the real value of using genomics and what the genomics does, they actually take the tissue, the cancerous tissue that was sampled at the biopsy. And I, I, as I explained to patients, it's like looking under the hood, uh, you know, the, the, you know, um, at, you know, what's the machinery behind this cancer. And it can, it right. tells you what genes are, are upregulated or downregulated that have an important impact on how that cancer is likely to behave. And so I found this to be very, very helpful and, I, and really further stratifying that patient's risk, whether they're sure. at higher risk or lower risk, so that you can help them navigate that complex decision about, well, is this safe? Is this a cancer I can safely watch? Or is this a cancer um, that I should aggressively treat? Um, and on that note, um, just recently, actually, at our, the, our major meeting in Europe, they updated a, a randomized trial of radiation surgery and active monitoring in, in men with prostate cancer. And what they showed was that there were not important survival differences overall based on the initial treatment you, you, you chose, but there was a much higher risk of metastasis in men who chose um, active monitoring or who were randomized to active monitoring. So these are men who were not subjected to things like repeat biopsies, genomics, MRI. So it shows you that there's a, a room for improvement and really nailing down that patient's risk before, you know, safely embarking upon a surveillance strategy. And I think genomics has a lot of value. I found it to be very reliable in my practice. Yeah, I, I agree. Look, it's it's a matter of making a, the, the the best informed decision you can. I, I do have patients that at no cost, you know, they're, they're going to undergo medical treatments, but at least they're making an informed decision. This is what you have. And, 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 you know, make it a decision based on that. I find it to be invaluable. Um, um, the, the, these tests, uh, for all the reasons that you mentioned. So then, by the way, uh, Dr. Stevenson, as you know, from the intro, he is a uh, part of Rush University. I might've said Reed, you know what I said, Reed, not about 30 minutes ago, or 40 minutes ago, I was talking about, we were talking, I was having a conversation with someone about, uh, about Steve jobs and okay. all the things he, and he went to Reed college. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. that, so, so, so that in, I think is in Portland, Oregon or something or somewhere Oregon. out there. So yeah. that, 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 that <laughs> the college, it stayed in my mind is rush university yes. rush. Um, so why do you think that at least, I mean, I think, you know, some of the col our colleagues or your colleagues that are, not up on these genomic tests. What, what do you think is happening there? Well, I think that, um, uh, you know, I, I, I was always very agnostic about all of these things. And I think there's something um, about seeing something that really, you know, there's a lot of evidence in other literature, you know, it's like seeing is believing. So, you know, the fact that we can see the tumor we can sample the tumor, 
that's going to give us the answer. And so, you know, a lot of people have really gotten on MRI for for active surveillance patients, despite the fact that there's not a whole lot of data supporting it in that in that clinical scenario. Nevertheless, I was a big MRI proponent because I really thought, boy, if we can really identify the important cancer, sample that, get an accurate Gleason's grade, then that'll help us. And as I mentioned, there's some randomized trials that haven't shown much benefit for MRI and surveillance populations. So the, the point of genomics, I think, is that, again, it, it's telling you about that behavior of that cancer. And, you know, there's certainly many, many studies that have shown, you know, even compared it to MRI, uh, some prospective studies, and it's shown that the most reliable indicator of, of what we call reclassification, so meaning mm. that we thought the patient was low risk, and now maybe they're not so low risk. So that's what we call low uh, uh, reclassification. The most important predictor of reclassification is the genomic test, far better than the MRI, far better than any other clinical parameters. And so, I, again, I found it to be very, very reliable. And I was a bit of a skeptic to genomics uh, at the outset. Uh, I still leaned heavily on MRI, but, you know, having used it, you know, for the last decade, I found, I, I just happened to use the GPS test in my practice. I found it to be highly, highly reliable. And so people often ask me, well, when would you do an MRI to consider for surveillance? When would you do genomics? I think I really lean on genomics in patients who have what we call grade group two disease. So it means mm -hmm. they mostly have low grade cancer. They have a little bit of high grade cancer. Is And, and there's so much a wide spectrum of behavior in those men with the grade group twos. So I certainly would lean heavily on genomics in that situation. I also use it in men who have a lot of cancer, but grade group one. So these are Gleason 6 cancers in many, many cores. And the reason being is that they have, if they have a lot of cancer present, sure. you may be missing a more high-grade component. So sure. I, I lean heavily on genomics there. MRI, I certainly, I think it has a role. I, I would tend to favor it in men who have very big prostates. I would tend to use it in men who have very high PSA levels, because that may be scenarios where there may be some, uh, you know, anterior, you know, large volume uh, cancer that's missed by conventional biopsies. So in that case, I certainly would lean heavily on MRI. Yeah, the other value with the MRI, I find, is that it gives you a pretty accurate uh, uh pretty accurate volume or size of the prostate, which is value. You could do a PSA density, and that's just another data point that yes. might be valuable. Yeah. So the, I mean, it's very, the, very yeah. costly just for to, you know, just to get, you know, size of the prostate is a very costly exam. But I, I find that aspect to be really, really useful. Yeah, I, I agree. And and it's also it gives you an important roadmap to make sure that you're not missing some important cancer. So um, certainly if the MRI shows you know, a high risk lesion, um, you know, certainly we would subject that patient to a repeat biopsy before committing them to surveillance. Right. Um, here's an interesting case that I, that I just had. Um, this is a, a young, young African-American male. So one mate can make the argument, Hey, any young African-American male, 48 years old, with a Gleason six, it doesn't matter what the Gleason is. We're, we're, we're going to treat it just because they're young and African American. Uh, so they typically have a predisposition to more aggressive disease. But in this particular case, he was on defense, right? He he was on defense. Uh, he's young, you know, forty eight year old, so he's very sexually active and so on and so forth. And I said, all right, look, let, let let's do a GPS, all right? Do a GPS. GPS was actually moderately high. Okay which is indicating that, all right, biopsy was at least in six, but there's probably something out there somewhere in the prostate that's higher. <clears throat> From that GPS uh, 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 outcome and uh, his ov overall conversation, he agreed to do a prostatectomy. So he got his prostate removed. It was upgraded to a Gleason 7. Okay. Uh, so, so there, I think, there is a case, a real life case, where we can see the value of, of some of these uh, genomic tests. So the, the the GPS that you mentioned, you know, what is it? What is it designed to predict? It's designed to predict men who either have prostate cancer that's extending outside the prostate, uh, or men who have a predominant component of high grade cancer. So these are grade groups three, four, five or Gleason 4 plus 3 or greater. You know, if you knew in an otherwise healthy man that he was at high risk for having 
extra prostatic disease or having you know predominantly high grade cancer you would not consider that patient for active surveillance and so i think that's what makes it very valuable and very actionable yeah. uh for both patients and physicians you know my 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 um uh, uh, our, uh, my audience and our my patients know that, look, we, we all have biases. Um, I, I try to teach any student that works with me, any medical student, that uh, which, to, to be aware of their bias and to monitor it or to kind of deal with it. Um, so I always want to know, you know, uh, so, so in a case like his, it's like, yeah, Gleason's sick. Look, I want you to be an, you're a young guy. My God, I am 50 years old. I don't, I don't want my prostate removed. So that's my bias. But of course, he's like, okay, this is not about me or my ideologies. This is about <laughs> this particular guy. So I, I, you know, I've learned so much from that case, right? Here we are. We have data point. GPS is high. Prostatectomy. Prostate came out. You know, he has a positive surgical margin, which can increase the risk of even a, a recurrence potentially. So it was, it was, a, it was a good move. It, it was a good move. So there's the value of that. Um. Lastly, um. So. I guess my next question is, let's just say, so you do robotic at this point, 100% robotic surgery? Yeah. So you are of age, and again, I'm not aging you. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm like, wow, this guy, you know, he, you look great, <laughs> actually. <laughs> you learned to do an open prostatectomy uh, back in the day. That's what you initially learned, right? That's correct. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I, I, my mentor at Sloan Kettering was a very renowned open prostatectomist. And I happened to complete my training at the dawn of the robotics era. So this is like, you know, 2005. Mm -hmm. So um, at the initial phase of my career, I was still doing some open prostatectomies, some robotics, but, you know, pretty much since you know, the last 15 years, it's been 100% robotics. And, I, and that's just a reflection of how the entire field has moved forward. Sure. Um, and, you know, there's some, you know, the younger some, guys, and, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I just gonna say there's some tangible advantages to doing the robot for sure. Uh, are there any, so the younger guys, right. The, the, the younger guys are, are training and have trained only in robotic. They have no idea how to do an open. <laughs> if I have, if this is a good question, actually, I hope so. <laughs> if I have prostate cancer and I'm thinking of getting my prostate removed, should I want to go to someone that has experience in both open prostatectomy and robotic, or just a guy that never trained in open and only does robotic, I, I should be in good hands. Why would I want to go to a, a guy like you or many others that have trained in both and have done both well? You know, I haven't done an open prostatectomy in over a decade or more. So, right. you know, we used to think, well, but I can tell you my open prostatectomy experience, I think, did make me a better robotic surgeon. Um, so I think I do my my robotic surgeon surgery is a little bit different than someone who say has done robotics on their entire career. So doing learning both approaches and, and having experience in both approaches, I think has made me a better robotic surgeon, believe it or not, uh, probably a better open surgeon as well. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, no, I think that, uh, you know, people thought, well, you know, if the robot breaks down or if there's some, some problem, you know, if you, if you don't know how to do. If the patient is really big, they have a big, you know, waistline, right. something goes wrong in the middle yeah. of the robot, but it just by now you you guys have seen happen. it all. Yeah, it doesn't really happen anymore. I think those were theoretical yeah. considerations. I think open prostatectomy, though a wonderful operation, I think has run its life cycle. I, I there's just uh, outside of a few older older surgeons, it's just not being done anymore. Um, interestingly, uh, you know where I come from in Canada, the robot is not available in many places, so they still do a lot of open oh, prostatectomy operations. So if you want an open prostatectomy, maybe you have to go north of the border. <laughs> wow, interesting. For a third of the cost, maybe? Uh, I mean, obviously the-, the If, if the you're paying out of pocket? Yeah, 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 well, yeah, that I don't know. I, I wouldn't be able to price <laughs> compare, but depends on the exchange rate. <laughs> right, exactly. My last question is the following. Um, you get, you remove the prostate. When do you order a a tumor, a uh, genetic test of the actual gland, like a decipher or a prolaris? Do you ever do it? And if so, when it when when do you choose to do so? Well, I mean, I think that the decipher test, which is a genomic test on prostatectomy mm -hmm. specimens, was developed uh, largely to identify men who are at 
risk for having recurrence for whom you would consider immediate radiation. Okay, it's something we call adjuvant radiation mm-hmm. uh, because there was uh, unclear whether we should give radiation to high-risk patients immediately after surgery, even if their PSA is zero, or whether we should observe these men and once the PSA starts to rise, treat. And perhaps we would lose some opportunity for cure if we chose the latter uh, approach. Um, I think that all the randomized trials to date have really shown that adjuvant is not any better than what we call early salvage, which basically means you monitor these men closely. Once the PSA starts to tick up, you give radiation in that situation. And the advantage of doing the latter is you save giving radiation to a whole bunch of patients and a lot of the toxicity associated with that. So I think even uh, the folks at Decipher would probably agree that um, the value of this test seems to be waning in light of that uh, important evidence. The other thing that's changed is there's improved imaging for recurrent prostate cancer, something called a PSMA PET scan. And I Mm -hmm. think that really has also changed the equation a lot. Now we're able to identify the disease and where it is much, much earlier than we could with any of the prior imaging studies. So I think for those reasons, we genomics is, I think in most people's practice, not something we typically order after the operation. It's done before the operation to help risk stratify. Wonderful. Thank you for that explanation. Uh, I don't think the Decipher folks uh, want to hear that. I, I, <laughs> they may not want to sponsor this podcast now, <laughs> but it's okay. This is this is what this is about. Well, no, no, we have, no, but, we... no, but I think Decipher certainly has a role in the pretreatment setting. And I yeah, think that's yeah. probably where it's being used most frequently nowadays. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, for sure. For sure. Um, last question. And this is really the last question, probably the most important question. You've been living in the U.S. for a long time now. So in a hockey game between Canada against the United States in the Olympics, who do you go for? Well, if there's hockey fans out there, uh, <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a young uh, fellow named Connor McDavid. Uh, who plays uh-huh. out in Western? This guy is uh, uh, a, a generational talent. Uh, so uh, I would oh, Michael Jordan ish, yes, Jordan ish well, kind of very, talent. Very Gretzky esque, perhaps. Uh-huh, uh, Gretzky, so yeah. I would I would I would want to cheer for the team who he plays for. He just happens <laughs> to be Canadian, so I think I'd, <laughs> I'd put my money on Team Canada. What is it? Obviously, I'm, I don't follow hockey too strongly. I've gone to maybe a couple of Ranger games here in New York. So what's his name again? His name is Connor McDavid. I'm going to look out yeah, for him because I like I just like great talent. You yeah, know? well, uh, I don't know about yeah. the name Connor, but the uh, people here in Chicago are like the Blackhawks have kind of tanked yeah. it, so they're hoping to get the number one pick. There's a young kid from Western Canada by the name of Connor Bedard, who's supposed to be another guy like Connor McDavid. Wow. So it's going to be exciting to see how these guys. Uh, start chasing some of these records and and win some Stanley Cups and things. So <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna look out for that. <laughs> but the Rangers are good. The Rangers are competitive this year. So you know don't, they are. Don't bet them. Don't bet on uh, bet them out. You know don't count and them they out. They were they were pretty good last year too. I went to a couple of games. Yeah, yeah. Hey, so this is Dr. Andrew Stevenson from Rush University in Chicago. Andrew, thank you so much. I can't tell you how much I appreciate uh, you being on on this late day today Thanks. um how can people uh be in touch with you if they want to reach out to you uh or to your work yeah i mean they, uh, you can find me on the rush website um mm-hmm. and we have a great and now team. that'll be in the show notes yeah the, the we have a great team of uh, people who if you have questions we can do in-person visits or virtual visits uh to discuss your you know any of your your prostate or urology problems so uh we try to to uh, make it easy to get you access. And, and um, so, you know, happy to, to field any questions from any of the audience at any point in time. Thank you so much. I hope, uh, you know, we never met in person, so I hope to, I'll, I will be in Chicago in a couple of uh, weeks Look forward uh, to that. at the AUA. So I hope to meet you then. Okay. Hopefully we got some nice weather for you. <laughs> I hope so. All right, Andrew. All right, thanks so best. much. Thanks so much. All the best. Thanks. Right, good, good night. Good night. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Dr. Geo podcast. You can watch all episodes of this podcast and much more by subscribing to my YouTube channel on youtube.com forward slash Geo Espinoza ND. 
If you love what you heard today, you can help by leaving a five-star review of the podcast on Apple and Spotify, as each review helps us reach more men who are serious about improving their urological health and how to function better with age. And for the latest research and actionable takeaways in the world of men's health and integrative urology, sign up for my newsletter at drgeo.com. I'll see you next time.